thinking of investing, working, or starting a business in the cannabis industry? We've got you covered right here on Plant Problems. Hosted by Tony Frischconnect, Plant Problems takes a different approach to cannabis than what you're seeing and hearing from the mainstream media. Come along with Tony and be in the know about how to invest, work, or start a cannabis business. Let's get the show started with your host, Tony Frischconnect. Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening in to Plant Problems. This is your host, Tony Frischconnect. I've got an amazing guest today. I've known this gentleman for quite some Hey everyone, Tony Frisch Connect here with Plant Problems. I want to thank you guys for listening in. You're why I do this show. And I also want to thank you for leaving me a review, taking your precious 15 seconds of your time and spending it with me and sharing me what I do well and what I can improve on. So please go to plantproblem.com and leave those questions, comments, or reviews. All right, back to the show time. He is a mover and shaker in the industry. I have Axie Blunden here with me today, and Axie has been a leader in the regulated cannabis space for a decade. From the front lines of legislative change to private sector of corporate cannabis, he is an entrepreneur and marketer who loves building and launching brands of businesses. Axie, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm glad you uh, had a little extra time for us this afternoon. I know you're busy, like I said, moving and shaking. So how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Tony. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to connect with you as a friend and colleague now in this new uh, way here. So congratulations on the show and thanks for having me. Thanks, Axie. There is always something new and interesting happening. You know, we've got these, the highs of COVID-19 happening and people are figuring their ways around that and business is changing daily right now as it is. But, you know, for us that have been in cannabis for quite some time, it's always changing quickly. It seems to be very fluid. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a moment where I feel well prepared. I think this industry is with all the the ebbs and flows. So actually, the reason why I brought you on today is I wanted to talk a little bit about white labeling and what it has to do with producing different products because there is so many CBD, hemp CBD products coming out that are just people, I've, I've talked to people, they think that it's saturated right now, it's not saturated, the market's here, we're not sure if the market's built. You know, there's so many different things being said. I know with brand Stracks, your extraction producing company, you're doing white labeling for people. And so I know you've created some other products in the past. So what has opened your eyes to saying white labeling is something that we're doing as a company and what we enjoy? I would say it was kind of backing into the processing and manufacturing side of things that got me personally into it. I kind of definitely come from the front lines as far as the retail marketing, experiential marketing, sponsorship events, those sort of things. And then my first product company, you know, we were a, a white label brand. We filled bottles and put our label, put a label on it, but everything that was coming in was a pre-formulated blend. That showed me the power of the brand. Coming from a brand perspective is something that you create a product and you're really part of that product. Essential part is the brand itself. And from there, I got on the processing side, started looking more at what's inside the product and not just the brand. And then he was able to kind of combine those things, you know, make a product and then also develop brands that go, you know, the label, the brand, the messaging that goes on that product. And in the cannabis world, you know, it's very fragmented. And so there are so many brands and so many people trying to create brands that everybody kind of wants one. And so to be able to have a great formulation, then you suddenly open yourself up to having multiple brands you can service. So, you know, I want to go back for a minute because you brought up something where you said you want to know what's inside the product. Can you expand on that a little bit more and, and kind of fill people in. What do you mean by what's inside of it? I mean, we know it's CBD in there, but but what does that mean to you as a good product? 
Well, that makes me think of kind of my experience cooking and kind of blending and being able to work on different formulations. And in the CBD world, it's very somewhat wide open and you're able to, you know, experiment with different formulations and try different blends, try different carrier oils. And, you know, then on the processing side, try try different, you know, solvents and different processes to get different cannabinoid profiles, be able to really hone in on that, the full entourage effect. For the listeners out there, when he's talking about all these different processes, he's talking about when he's stuck in carriers, these are delivery systems for the CBD itself, right, Axie? That's correct. And then different processes of extraction. And when he goes into that, he's more so discussing what it takes to create a better product. Because different extraction processes produce different products, right? Absolutely. And that's evolved over time and continues to. I don't think that's really talked about very much because people, well, you just extract it, right? It's the simple word of, well, let's just go and extract that. Well, okay. Comes down to so many things like efficiency, right? Cost. You know, what people see is safe. People consider, well, I don't want to intake that because they extracted it with this product. So, how do you come to, as a white label company, How do you come to the fact where, you know, you're going to decide on this is the process we want to use because we think it's best for our product and our customer? You know, we've come to that through a lot of research and a lot of experimenting and we're, you know, always up for evolving. I mean, it does, it has changed a lot. Like I, you know, I remember coming from the CO2 extraction world where that was kind of the, the end all be all, you know, super critical or subcritical CO2 was the only way otherwise, you know, and looked at other forms as inferior. And, you know, it's kind of, you can look at each one and give you any set of data and there's a lot of, there's different pros and cons. And then through it evolving, you know, now we use a ethanol system and it is, produces a beautiful full spectrum profile of cannabinoids and terpenes. And we're able to work with our systems and and our IP to manipulate that in different ways. Whereas previously, ethanol was kind of thought as, as a bulk cheap way of doing it. I was even in a school of thought that that wasn't a high quality process. And now that's completely changed, but I still wouldn't look at CO2 and say, we shouldn't use that. We shouldn't look at that as an option because it does do things we need. Like it can separate the terpenes entirely and you can use those for other uses. So it is kind of like back to that. It is kind of like cooking in a way where uh, you can experiment and that can lead to a beautiful result. And, you know, even making a mistake or something that turns out not the way you you wanted it to be can actually lead to something incredible. Discovering, isolating a new cannabinoid, getting an incredible flavor. We have very strict SOPs for what goes out the door, but we definitely remain open as a test kitchen to come up with new formulations. Well, you got to always be R&D, right? So basically research and development to figure out, hey, is there something we're missing? Is there any way to make this better? Can we make a better product? Can we have our product here, but make a better extraction that does something better for the the formulation or the consumer, right? That's right. You know, we got to stay open to that. And that's kind of why we don't just offer white label. We kind of delineate between white label, which is a product made to be a brand to be sold in many locations, as opposed to a private label product, which is an in-house brand that's sold at one retail location with one or multiple stores. So you think about like the generic pasta or generic canned food you see at a Kroger or a grocery store sitting next to the name brand. That's a private label because that's only available there. And then, you know, as opposed to white label, which is somebody saying like uh, Manning on your walls. And then if a sports star is saying, I want to make a CBD product, I'm going to get somebody to white label that where they pick out a formulation And then they put their brand on it and distribute it everywhere. So that's white label versus private label. A lot of people get those confused or think that they're the same thing. And then from there, another tier would be custom formulation where they say, we want to have your private label product, but we want to tweak this ingredient. They come to the test kitchen, so to speak, with their own recipe modifications. And they work with you, the kitchen, the lab, to make that for them. I want to let everybody know, you know, Another reason why I have Axion is he's got some pretty fun stuff that he's in the middle of, and I'm going to share this with you here shortly, so please hang tight. But Axie, as 
what are the advantages of somebody coming to you and saying, hey, will you make this product for me? I mean, as a business owner on the other end, coming to find a company like you that does white labeling, what are the advantages that are available in that capacity? I mean, you know, as a processor, we're kind of sitting in the middle of it all with the biomass coming in and products going out. And, you know, our job is to make the best product for other companies and help them succeed. And, you know, so we're a trusted partner for many. We're a trusted partner for a competitor. And it's not even like, and this is the CBD market. And it's, you know, it's not, I like to call it co-opetition where we're, we're helping a lot of different people launch something. I mean, a lot of small farms that got to the end of their year and didn't know what to do with their product, or maybe they wanted to do a little bit of everything, end up wanting to create a, a brand no matter how small it is. And so it allows us to get a lot of people off the ground. It allows us to get a lot of product to market. In fact, that's kind of our real goal with Brandstrax, with the processing company, is to help farmers get their products to market by manufacturing and distributing unique hemp products. And, so when, and you're doing that with, I believe we talked before you were, AQB LLC is also helping create those products for the farmer like you're talking about or the small business owner, right? That's right. AQB LLC is a business I started in 2016 when I left the corporate cannabis world. And that was to focus on CBD supply chain management and distribution. And I had a couple positions, started a a private label brand during that time, and then started this processing company. And so brought those relationships and several farms and brands on board, you know, since expanded that. And so that essentially manages what comes into the factory, so to speak, and then also what is made and not sold to another business to sell, but is made and then sold to the market comes in there as well to dist- on the distribution side. And so it isolates the two in a strategic way and then also brings them together in a mutually beneficial way. Well, you're also, you know, I've talked, had several interviews recently where you're kind of, you're right there on them. So you're watching the growth happen because you have multiple touching businesses that you're working. And so you're seeing what is going on constantly, right? That's right. Absolutely. From a bird's eye and a at the table and just an observer perspective. So how come more small businesses, why aren't they just processing their own stuff? It's challenging. It's a lot of startup. It's a fair amount of risk. I mean, I, you know, the farmers took the ultimate risk by planting this stuff and, you know, betting the farm on it, so to speak. People don't understand that though. Yeah, I know. And, you know, next in line is us getting hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment installed and put up and like waiting for the relationships and hoping that the farmer's crops do well and, you know, all these different things. And so, but we, you know, we trusted in the farmers that set up in the Southeast, you know, in a new market and we set up our processing unit there and we're able to bring a lot of biomass in and a lot of, send a lot of products out. Have you built some strategic partnerships along the way as you're building these white labels with other businesses? Yes. You know, that's again where like the management and distribution company comes into play where it's once that's something that the factory has made and we're sending out the door, then we have, we engage with them on the sales and distribution side. Many times it'll be farm gets to the end of their season, the market crashes on the flower side and then they want to turn it into crude and then they have crude on their hands and then they have to sell crude. And it's this whole other thing that they didn't sign up for. And then you know, want to make a product and we can make them the product. And then they're like, how do we sell the product? And it's not because they're idiots. It's just because it's a new market and people are coming at it from all angles. And, you know, I've been in this world a long time. A lot of established strategic partnerships and relationships where we had to get things done. Well, and being actually, I should say, getting to that point of success takes more than where your plan was going doesn't always end up where you think it's going to end up, right? And so in order to, I would say, in order to see those successes, you have to be able to shake and move and pivot very quickly. Because how many people do you know that failed to an extraction at this point? Oh, I mean, most. When you say most, are we talking like 75%? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, it depends how you break it down. If you broke it down by, like, who signed up for a processing list and processed anything, it's probably, like, less than 5%. And then if you talk about people that maybe, I mean, it depends how you measure it. And some people are processed, to them, processing is trimming and bagging and or different things. So it's hard to, hard to like, quantify that. Yeah. It's definitely hard to get established. It's not like you're, like, 9 out of 10 people are successful at this. It's not like opening a dispensary in Colorado in the early days where it was, if you got the license, you were pretty much good. Or it's not like buying a dispensary in Colorado these days. Back on the front lines, the risk is high and so is the opportunity that it presents. What type of markets are do you guys sell in right now? Are you guys in multiple states? Are you in only one state? Or Because I know you're back in North Carolina right now, correct? Yeah, that's correct. In Asheville. We are absolutely in multiple states and you know at this point establishing in multiple countries we serve the the local market here which is a very hyper local regional market and demographic which is great a lot of small farms and we manage and work with farms from you know throughout the carolinas west virginia new jersey you know a lab in maine we work closely with and then you know, sell throughout, you know, basically Florida to Maine. And, you know, recently we were shipping cannabis to Colorado. I thought that was pretty awesome. You're not doing that anymore? Well, I mean, I mean, sure we are. We just recently sent a large shipment oh, okay. of trimmed, smokable flour to Colorado. Oh, very cool. It's like the opposite of Coles to Newcastle, you know? Yeah, yeah. I thought that was pretty funny. It's strange how a 180 happens very quickly, right? Yeah. I mean, you've got some massive producers down south that at least I've been hearing have have changed gears very quickly into hemp. And your production rate has to be pretty massive at this point now already. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our farm group last year did uh, 100,000 pounds, uh, you know, north of that. And we're not processing all of that because we're – you know, that's above our needed capacity. We've been finding other labs to work with that are much, you know, that are facilities, that giant facilities that have been converted over, you know, for this purpose. And that's not our real, you know, we're not like a bulk mass processor. We're more focused on craft and going end to end, you know, creating finished products. So are you familiar with the FDA report that came out here? When was it like a month ago? regarding the report to Congress on what they came back with CBD and the harmful effects. Have you heard anything? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. That was pretty upsetting. It's pretty interesting in a way that it's a little different than what most people thought, right? I mean, at least what what are your thoughts on that? Before you go, so just to familiar listeners out there that missed one of my episodes, but I talked about this in in my I think it's the two episodes prior to this one. And they said there's there's potential to liver damage from using CBD. Now, whether or not that information is all accurate is one thing to go off of. But I like to ask, I, you know, I got to ask you as a CBD manufacturer and all the products you make, what are you guys doing to either help understand this with the FDA or working with it to stay ahead of it. How are you working on that or how have you thought about that? So first I'd like to respond to the FDA report itself because while I'm not saying any of that was invalid, I just would be interested to see if there was that sort of scrutiny put on the potential cons of like just about anything that are unregulated and readily available as far as like alcohol, tobacco, sugar. I know we're doing the research. It seems a little of an unbiased scrutiny. And I just can't get over the alcohol, the tobacco, the pharmaceuticals, the the under-the-counter, over-the-counter, you know, any types that are readily distributed happily by the pharmacopoeia, that world. And all those products definitely damage your liver. Yeah. And the fact is, is that like, sure, you you can find, you can dig up some kind of dirt that some kind of damage a good thing could have to some kind of person. But that doesn't mean that people shouldn't have the freedom to do what they want with what the things that grow on this planet. And then more concisely to the FDA, all I can say that we operate and are aware and are above and beyond compliant in every area possible. 
while still being activists towards, you know, the best outcome for people and for the economy and for the industry and for everything, which is, which is undoubtedly to have it be considered a grass substance, like generally regarded as safe, which means that it can be readily added to any type of product, whether it be for consumption or topical application or vaping or smoking, things like that without major regulatory hurdles. That's the best outcome possible. And the worst outcome possible without going back to the era of prohibition would to be CBD, cannabidiol, or you know other cannabinoids, aside from super high levels of THC, considered to be controlled substance. CBD should not be a controlled substance. It should be something that you can put in anything. I agree that super high THC should be regulated like alcohol, like it is in Colorado, where if you're of age, you can get it at a place with your ID that's regulated and taxed and legal and above board. And if you need a super high dose, you get a prescription, you know, kind of like over-the-counter, under-the-counter medicine. The general CBD and cannabinoid market remains aware and regulated at the lowest level by the powers that be, such as a generally regarded as safe substance or a grass substance. So one thing that I did find interesting, and, and I'd like to get your take on this as well, is that repeatedly in that report, they talked about leaving their, basically leaving the window open for people to give them their R&D or their research or feedback on whether this is the case or not. Do you feel that that is honest and open, or do you think that's just a ploy to placate the masses that are working on CBD and, and feel that it is, is very safe for us? What do you think is going on there? I think it's honest. I mean, I think that there's good people at the FDA, you know, that are in a government agency that's in a really, you know, outdated system. And we're seeing that repeat itself every day, you know, now it's just the problems with, you know, and it's not government, like we need to embrace government and, you know, as a institution in a way, because it's there, you know, we can't get rid of it. And it does a lot of good. And obviously, the FDA needs to be a sovereign place of thoughtful people making good decisions in the, in the interest of, of all of us, not in the interest of the lobbyists or politicians or corporations. And, you know, the same goes with USDA. And, I, you know, I'm a believer that there's good people and that we're going to have a favorable outcome because in my experience, how long I've been in this industry, I've seen it bring together people from across all aisles and bring, you know, make friends of enemies in society and uh, really level the playing field and like bring people together because it does so much good. And because it turns out you can create abundance and have a conscious form of capitalism that doesn't destroy our lives and destroy the planet. People that want to go out there and do things and build something are going to do it. And they don't, they can still do that without it damaging others. I talk about this so much, but the opportunities that are available especially right now with the way things are changing are immense. I mean, one of the things that you've recently come up with and just expand your horizon on how to see an opportunity and seize it, I'd like to have you share with what you're working on and, and what you put together in, in a short amount of time. Yeah, you must be talking about the sanitizer tsunami. Yes, that's it. <laughs> got swept up in. Yeah, so... When uh, coronavirus really started taking off and hitting close to home, my friends and family couldn't get sanitizer products. The CDC was recommending we all have with us and realized that we had a large amount of ethanol at the lab and an ability to put it together. And we started giving it away to friends and family and then providing it to frontline healthcare workers and at-risk workers and other essential businesses. And some of our regular business accounts caught wind of that and started placing orders. You know, I had this brand that I've had kind of sitting on the shelf, Helios, the god of sun. And I dusted that off the shelf and it was the perfect fit. You know, the sun being the original and best disinfectant. And put this brand that was born for this new product on the label, you know, and then kind of white labeling my own product here. There you go. Within, 
you know, that was like two weeks ago, and we've made over 10,000 units. We have over 20,000 in orders. It's in 40 stores. We published multiple times. We've sold to hundreds of consumers online. We're still giving it away, starting a program that will continue to provide sanitizer products to those in need, frontline workers and healthcare workers at at no cost, that will be supported by the, the purchase of Helios hand sanitizer. So is it something like somebody buys one and then you give one to? That's essentially the model, like the old Tom Shoes model. And we're working out the mechanics on that, but we're it's a great product. It's a plant-based, all-natural sanitizer product. It's just ethanol, vegetable glycerin, deionized water right from here at the Blue Ridge Mountains, a spring nearby that as a water facility, and then naturally occurring hemp terpenes that give it a wonderful aroma. And so it's a really nice product, and we're providing it to those that, that need it and are willing to buy it on the website or at the store where, stores where it's available, and then we're going to continue to give it away. So as a white label product, from the moment you thought about it until you got some in the bottle and put it together, you own the extraction side of it. But for those out there looking to make a product, how fast did that actually happen for you? If you, if you, from date to date, what do you think it took you to put this together? Uh, it was 24 hours. Wow. That's impressive, man. We had all the ingredients and it was like part of like building this laboratory, you know, it's like, I'll get these things and you wonder like, oh, maybe I'll never use it. Or, I mean, frankly, like, people will leave their stuff and suddenly we'll have all these containers. So it's like, oh, I'll just use this and... And it was a great environment to launch a product. So for anybody that came in, of course, to talk to a white label company, this is an anomaly. It generally can't turn it around that fast. But it does show you the ability on what somebody can do very quickly with somebody that has the right materials. I mean, somebody could come into you and say, I want to make a lotion. How long would it take me to make a lotion with brand strikes, right? Well, actually, that's something that we could do in-house, but once you get to bulk, you know, that's why we back to co-op petition work with other ones. Because I'm not going to say you could come to us and make some nanotropic face serum that, you know, goes in your ears and has some sort of crazy, you know, because we do have limits. But we have people, if we can't do it, we work with people that do, and then we can bring it in-house and things like that. And so, you know, just to be realistic about it and also be optimistic about it, that's also part of it, that ability to, to think that way. And then to ask others and seek help when you don't know or can't do it, that's also a big part of just being able to do it. That's a big tool to have in your toolbox is to be able to say, I don't know. Let me ask somebody that might know. Yeah. So back again, be realistic about it. I mean, what, what do you think it take a week to put it together? Two weeks? This product, yeah. Literally 24 hours, it was in a bottle, printed a label at our and then, you know, designed, then thought of the brand, put the brand on a, we luckily have a, a printer right down the road that's amazing and high quality and can turn things around quickly. All the stars kind of aligned. Yeah, yeah. And then we're giving it away and then large accounts wanted more of it. We were able to secure our bottles coming from our manufacturer in China and secure plenty more ethanol and all the other ingredients. And then, you know, now I'm looking at the compliance side and how to build and scale sanitizer company that because there's no cannabinoids in it it's no i'm like it's suddenly not even in the cannabis world that's the one thing i was going to touch on i'm glad you did is so for the listeners out there that are wondering about what he's actually done is very unique in the fact that he was in cannabis now he's got a product that has you know what are the regulations on hand sanitizer it's like soap right I'm pretty well versed on this now. There are actually <laughs> there are current FDA regulations on making sanitizer, and okay. you know we're not the only ones doing this. We're definitely one of the very first. But there's you know a lot of breweries and distilleries. Basically, anybody that had isopropyl or ethanol sitting around are want to help people are doing this. So there's temporary guidelines around it right now that allows us to do this. And we're going to be pivoting the, the manufacturing and, you know, essentially starting a whole new company here for sanitizer to separate it for legal and regulatory purposes and move it into a compounding pharmacy that we, you know, already have arranged. That's actually in progress now. 
so that it'll be in a fully compliant zone so that it can continue to grow. That's incredible. I, I love the story of like, we thought it, we had it in process. And, and these are things that really time is of the essence when you're in that mode. If you sit and think too long, you think you tend to think about a lot of reasons why you shouldn't do it, right? And there's so many why you should, especially when we're in this funky little market right now. You've got to survive as a company and you got to, so you can be successful because these other goals that you have, they're still going to include that, but now they've given you kind of a lifeboat, right? As you're going through this process. That's right. And, you know, that persistence and kind of, telling that voice in your head that says, don't do it. You can't do that. You're not supposed to do that. It really, the voice that overrode that was that, no, people need this. People need this. And like, this is what we can do to help. Luckily, you know, uh, CBD is somewhat recession proof like THC. And we've been able to put out of work people to work. We've like tripled our workforce and we put out of work musicians and hospitality individuals to work in a very sanitary, social distance kind of way. And now we have this little bubble of people. We're running the lab 12 to 18 hours a day, fulfill these, you know, these orders because we're still doing a lot of it by hand. It's all been driven by, you know, a real wanting to help and get in there and, you know, do what we can for humanity as we're fighting this virus, which is really more of an existential threat. And, you know, I would just love to see a world where, you know, we would mobilize around, everyday threats like so many broken systems in our world the you know the war on drugs the military industrial complex what we're doing to the planet our only home you know if we could rally beyond that for one second like our whole planet has rallied behind this virus then we could make real permanent change and i see that i see you know that being what is on the other side of this is going to be some real permanent change for a lot of people and a lot of businesses and, you know, society as a whole. And just like I believe the FDA and the USDA is going to get their shit together and not do the wrong thing, I feel like we're going to get our shit together and do the right thing on the other end of this. Really where we're coming from is just trying to do the right thing and help. Helios is here to help. That's cool. Well, Axie, do you have a website where people can reach out to you or, uh, or some contact info where they can find you? Absolutely. For Helios hand sanitizer, you can go to heliossanitizer.com. And for business inquiries around processing and white label, you can go to brandstracks.com. That's B-R-A-N-D-S-T-R-A-C-T-S.com. Helios is H-E-L-I-O-S sanitizer.com. And, you know, feel free to reach out personally. My uh, email is axie at heliossanitizer.com and axie at b-r-a-n-d-s-t-r-a-c-t-s.com. Awesome. Well, I hope all the listeners out there enjoyed this episode as much as I did. I, I really, you know, one of the things that drives me is seeing people like yourself that find that little, that little fire and then, and basically throw gasoline on it. Or ethanol. Or ethanol, whatever, right? (laughs) If you're a struggling entrepreneur out there, like we all have been, and we'll still continue it as we open new businesses, you know, these are the things that really change the way you look at how the struggle happens. Because the struggle is going to always happen, and you're going to be in the trenches and digging your way through that. But actually finding those little pick-me-ups that can change your whole life, your whole business life. Those are what fire me up. And I know most other entrepreneurs on why they love business because they they get to find and solve those problems and come with solutions. You that are struggling out there, I do feel for you. The next thing I want to say to you is that you have to push on because pushing on to the next step until you see some of that success, that's what it takes. And Axie has been through 10 years of the cannabis industry. He's worked for some big companies. He's also started some companies. He's had a hemp company with CBD hemp. He's extraction processing, as well as producing products for the end user right now. So this is a lot of stuff that he's had to go through to where he finally has sparked something that is like, okay, 
I've got this going and I've got this going. So please push forward and know that this is normal. This is how it works. And this is how you get to success. So I want to thank everybody for listening out there today. And I look forward to sharing more with you. Please reach out to Axie or me. You can always reach out to uh, plantproblem.com. I've got all my episodes there. Leave questions or comments there. And I am also active on social media, so you can find me everywhere there. So thank you so much for listening today. And I hope I was able to bring something that you guys were able to learn today and something you've taken using your own business. So I appreciate you guys listening. In. See you next time. You've just listened to another insightful episode of Plant Problems. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to tell your friends and colleagues. For additional resources or to leave a review, head over to plantproblem.com. Join us again next week on Plant Problems with Tony Frischconnect. We look forward to having conversations with you as we go along this journey. 